Hello, my name is Daniel Mills and I'm Professor of Veterinary Behavioural Medicine in the School of Life Sciences at the University of Lincoln. And I'm going to be joined by my colleague Kevin McPeak, who's now a lecturer at the Royal Dick School of Veterinary Studies at the University of Edinburgh. When Kevin worked with me at Lincoln, he developed the Canine Frustration Questionnaire as uh, part of his PhD. And he'll be talking about that and some of the other scales that we've developed at Lincoln. We've been developing psychometric instruments at Lincoln for quite some time now, and we find them very valuable in the um, behaviour clinic. They can give us uh, important insights into a case, but I want to emphasise these are not instruments that give a specific diagnosis. They're there to complement what we do within the clinic. And what we want to do is introduce the questionnaires to you today and show you how you can easily access them um, as they're now available freely online. So this presentation is divided into three parts. I'm going to start by saying a little bit about psychometric instruments that we use in clinical animal behaviour, focusing on the ones that we use at Lincoln. And then I'll hand over to Kevin and he's going to talk in more detail about the specific instruments and also finally tell you how you can access these instruments for free. So let's start by talking a little bit about what we mean by a psychometric instrument and how they're used in clinical animal behaviour. So a psychometric instrument is a tool that you use to assess an internal state that cannot be measured directly. We can't know what an animal is thinking or feeling, but we can design instruments that help to give us some insight into this. It's more than just a simple questionnaire and there are a range of um, instruments out there that can be used and they have their own particular uh, use and application. We're going to focus on the Lincoln ones at the moment. However, one thing I want to emphasise is it's very easy to produce poor quality instruments. And one of the things that we're very proud of with regards to the instruments that we've produced at Lincoln is that we've put a lot of effort into making sure that these instruments have some degree of validity. Uh, and it's important if you're thinking about using some sort of scale uh, or aid like this, that you know about the quality of the instrument. And there are two elements to quality. There's reliability and there is validity. And actually, you don't necessarily need an instrument to be valid for it to be useful in a clinical context. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a little while. What's important is that validation is never complete. And so you need to understand the limits and also understand how to use these instruments appropriately. So, for example, something like the sea bark or the fee bark can also be used in clinical animal behaviour, and you may be familiar with these. These were produced by James Sapel at the University of Pennsylvania, but they are behaviour profiles. They describe the behaviour of the animal in a range of different contexts. They can be useful, but as I said, we're not going to talk about uh, those in relation to this particular presentation. So what are the two measures of quality, reliability and validity actually refer to? Well, you need reliability in order to have validity, but you don't need validity to have reliability. So we're going to consider reliability first. Basically, reliability means that the instrument is freedom from errors of measurement. It tells you about the precision of the test. And it means that if you use the test on two separate occasions to measure the same thing, in effect, you'll get the same answer. So when we assess reliability, we're looking for consistency across a variety of settings. That can be um, assessment by the same person on a number of occasions. That's what we mean by intra rater reliability. Or we can look at uh, inter-rate reliability. If you assess something using that instrument and I use the same instrument, do we come up with the same score? If so, we have good inter-rate reliability. And then we have the concept of test-retest um, within subjects. And that's another measure of reliability, that if we repeat the test um, within a subject, we should get some consistency. 
There's also reliability relating to the components that make up uh, the instrument. These are referred to as items. We tend not to refer to them as questions, nor do we refer to the instruments as questionnaires, uh, because they're not actually asking questions, and that's why we use the term items. And in order to as assess that uh, the items are grouping together in a meaningful way, then we assess what's known as internal consistency. And those items that are all supposed to measure the same construct um, should all move in a similar way um, when we measure different individuals with different levels of the trade. So together they make a single scale. That's what we mean by unidimensionality. However, one of the scales we're going to talk about measures two constructs. What's important is that each of the constructs has unidimensionality um, because they're quite different uh, constructs. So the Panas scale measures positive and negative activation, which is basically measuring sensitivity to rewards and sensitivity to averses. Other questionnaires like the canine frustration questionnaire and the impulsivity assessment scale measure just a single construct, frustration and uh, impulsivity. So all the items are uh, grouped together and have a degree of internal consistency. However, as we'll see, there are um, components that make this up each of these scales as well. So whilst all the items are measuring, for example, impulsivity, there are three elements that make up impulsivity and the items within those subscales um, vary slightly different to each other. The reason why we ask several questions on a question or we have several items within an instrument is because it allows us to um, cover a broader range of aspects of the trait that we're interested in. And that's quite important because that increases the sensitivity of the instrument if it's well designed. Now, I mentioned earlier that an instrument um, doesn't necessarily need to be valid. Uh, it just needs to be reliable in some situations. So, for example, even if an instrument uh, doesn't measure exactly what we want, so it's not a valid measure of a particular construct, it can be used for monitoring purposes. If it gives an approximation and it's free from um, errors of measurement, then we can measure change. Take, for example, if you go on a set of scales and they always make you five kilos heavier than you are, those are not valid scales because the measurement they give you does not tell you your true rate, weight. However, if you go on a diet and you start to lose weight, the scales will let you know that you are losing weight. So in that sense, they are reliable. Yeah. But they're just not valid. So you don't know your real weight, but you do know whether you're gaining weight or losing weight. So, as I said, we can use um, scales that haven't been fully validated in order to monitor patients. But as we'll see, the scales we're going to be talking about have a good degree of validation as well as being reliable. So let's now turn to the issue of um, validity. So, as you've probably already gathered, the concept of validity refers to how much the instrument measures the construct of interest, whether that be positive activation, negative activation, impulsivity, frustration, anxiety or fear. And there are various components of validity. There is content validity, which basically means does it fully describe what it's supposed to? And we can use things like face validity. It seems to relate to the thing that we're interested in. The items are all asking about um, the sort of thing that we think should be related to this uh, particular instrument. And I'm not going to go into the details of how we generate that, but the scales we're going to talk about all have face validity. Next, there is the issue of construct validity. And that means, does it vary in the way it should? So, um, do the items come together? Um, and do they discriminate? 
um, between individuals who do and don't have um, high and low levels of a particular trait. So uh, that's what we mean by both convergent and discriminant validity. And then there is the issue of criterion validity. Do the items relate to real world expression? Do they help us make predictions? Do they agree with other scales that might have been developed? And there are other forms of validity as well. So it's important when you read about a particular instrument that you establish what degree of uh, validation that it has. Somebody might claim something to be a valid scale, but that might just mean that it's got face validity. Has it actually been used to assess differences between individuals um, with different degrees of uh, the condition um, that might have been measured by um, some other means, for example, physiological means? And as we'll see, when it comes to things like the um, both DIAS, the the Dog Impulsivity Assessment Scale, and the CFQ, the Canine Frustration Questionnaire, both of those underwent extensive validation uh, with behavioural um, tests. So um, there was concurrent validity in that situation. And there was also convergence shown between the measures that we used. And these, as these scales get used more and more by people, both researchers and clinicians, so the valid validity improves. So uh, validation is, is never complete. So um, I've mentioned already the CBARC and the FEBARC um, scales, and these are behavioral profiles. The Lincoln instruments are more assessments of particular psychological states. Um, the CBARC and FEBARC ask about particular behaviours and their intensity. And, and what you get from that are measures of uh, the intensity of particular types of behaviour. So perhaps aggression towards unfamiliar people by asking questions about the dog's uh, aggressive behaviour towards unfamiliar adults and unfamiliar children, males and females. So you could have several elements that um, make up a, a scale to tell you about uh, the animal's reaction to unfamiliar individuals. And as I said, they can be quite useful. And there is the fee bark, which is the feline equivalent as well. Uh, and you can use that. The scales we're going to talk about, the Lincoln ones, are all used in the dog. And sea bark and fee bark, it, it's actually perhaps more useful to look at the individual items and they do have a good degree of reliability, so they can be useful for monitoring individuals. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we use these scales um, uh, in order to supplement what we do in the clinic. They are not a substitute um, for doing a good behavioural history, uh, nor are they a substitute necessarily for some behavioural tests. They help to give us a broader view. Now, some of the tests that we're going to talk about relate to um, personality or temperament, and some relate to more specific items. And it's important to understand the difference between these. Getting an idea of the animal's underlying personality can be quite important, because a problem is not just an animal's personality, it's its reaction to particular triggers. And that's what is the concern to the owner. But if they have a personality that exacerbates that issue, that might indicate that um, we may need to use perhaps uh, other measures, for example, psychopharmacy, in order to bring about long-term change. And if we don't, the animal could be at high risk of relapse. But we'll return to that in a little while. So let's just look at how um, traits are actually uh, constructed. Things like impulsivity and uh, frustration questionnaires measure uh, impulsivity and frustration as traits and the positive and negative activation um, scales also measure those constructs as traits. Traits are broad predispositions. They're made up from the animal's behaviour um, across a wide variety of contexts and the animal will have a particular way of behaving in those um, 
context. Now, it might vary a little bit, um, but there will be a general tendency. And that's what we mean by the animal's habitual response. And that habitual response is measured by measuring its individual response. So if we were doing a behavior test, let's take, for example, we uh, do a particular test and on uh, three out of the four occasions, the animal responds in one way. And on the fourth occasion, it responds in a different way. I've illustrated that on this slide with um, the uh, responses in red and black at the bottom. You've got the stimulus, you've got the response. We would say that the habitual response was more the red response than the black response, because that's what occurred um, three out of four times. And this perhaps shows you one of the problems with doing simple behavior tests, because animals do vary from time to time. Uh, so in this particular case, you have a one in four chance of getting the wrong uh, answer if you just depended on a behavior test. By measuring the animal's habitual response in a particular context, then we can get rid of that sort of error. Now, that habit relates to a very specific um, context and in the questionnaire we'll ask the animal about, about how the animal normally responds in that situation. So a given item will tell us about the animal's habitual response. But actually the trait exists in a much wider range of contexts so we need to ask about the animal's response in a wide range of situations. So we might ask about how the animal copes with um, noisy crowded places um, and we could get the animal's habitual response for that. But then related to that might be the idea of how does the animal respond to um, high levels of novelty and that would be a second habit and it's by putting together related habits that we get an idea of the trait that we're trying to scale. And that's what the questionnaires do. So if you think about um, the items in, in the instrument, each of them is measuring the animal's habitual response, but we're getting it from the owner, who is the individual who really knows the animal and knows its typical behavior. We're not taking the animal and testing it in a perhaps unusual environment, or the animal might be feeling a particular way on a particular day. And so we reduce the error of that. And that's the advantage of using these sorts of instruments, is that um, the animal's sort of day-to-day -day changes in behavior, the error we get from that can be controlled for. But there's a lot of work that has to go into the development of these uh, instruments to make them valid. We have to make sure that the items are reliable themselves, that people understand them, etc. And if you're interested, please do read the papers about them. So we're going to talk about a range of the instruments that we've developed at Lincoln. I've mentioned already the DIAS and the Canine Frustration Questionnaire and the PANAS. And we'll talk about these in a little while. These measure underlying predispositions, aspects of temperament, character, personality, that sort of um, aspect of behaviour. However, we are going to talk about a couple of other instruments. The Lincoln Sound Sensitivity Scale. Um, which can be used to uh, help identify a, the animal's intensity of noise fear uh, or reactivity, and also the Lincoln Canine Anxiety Scale. The Lincoln Sound Sensitivity Scale and uh, Anxiety Scale can both be used to uh, monitor cases. The Sound Sensitivity Scale tells you about the animal's general behaviour in a particular episode. Um, so that's why it can be used for both um, defining something of clinical significance and in the development of some drugs, people have used the score on the Lincoln Sound Sensitivity Scale as a particular threshold to say this is when it's clinically significant. That's convenient for um, clinical trials, for developing licensed drugs, um, but I would say in, when we're dealing with individual cases, that's of less importance. So I'm not going to go into that in uh, any great detail or any more detail. 
if we're thinking about monitoring a case, if we're thinking about a cluster of events, how was the dog's reaction to fireworks last year compared to this year, then we might use something like the Lincoln Sound Sensitivity Scale. However, if we want to know about uh, the dog's reaction to a specific event, so rather than fireworks, but the, um, the bang that has just happened, then we'll want to use the Lincoln Canine Anxiety Scale. As I said, these instruments do not replace good clinical skills, but they can improve the quality of our uh, behavior practice. Because the instruments are standardized, they reduce our personal biases. We ask all of the questions and make sure that uh, we gather all the information. And that can be converted into a relatively straightforward score that can then be used to make judgments, but also um, used to make decisions about whether or not um, we wish to uh, use something like medication or pheromones in order to help in the management of a case. Um, so they can be used in monitoring. We can measure the animal's response in the clinic and then we can measure it um, sort of uh, two weeks, four weeks after we start treatment and see how things have improved and see whether or not the interventions that we're proposing are having uh, the desired effect. As I've already indicated, when we're thinking particularly about predispositions, things like temperament, we see that as one of the main indications for using medication. It's one thing to have an animal that is scared of a particular noise, but if the animal is also fearful temperamentally, then it is going to be much more likely to relapse later on. Um, if it doesn't have some additional support in the form of medication or perhaps pheromone treatment. And we can actually use the scales as we become more skilled in their use, in, in their use um, to evaluate the uh, influence of other potential moderators. So by looking carefully at some of the components that make up positive activation, um, we can gain some insight into the potential occurrence of things like chronic pain in the case because animals that have chronic pain often become um, depressed and that can be revealed in things like um, low positive activation but equally it might be um, apparent from things like poor persistence so the animal might uh, respond very well to positive stimuli but it may not be very persistent in um, activities that involve a lot of effort if it's got painful joints. But, you know, that's something that uh, develops with clinical practice. Uh, what we want to do today is introduce you to these instruments um, and make sure you know how to use them uh, and how to access them and, and see, you know, uh, what benefits they bring to you. And uh, perhaps we can meet up uh, later on and discuss your experience. I'm going to hand over now to my colleague uh, Kevin, who's going to take you through the individual instruments in more detail. So we're now going to look at the canine psychometric scales available. Uh, three of these are PANAS, DIAS and the CFQ. I'll go through each of these in turn, but it's important, important to note that all of these use a five point Likert scale. There's the same method of scoring for each and uh, there's different reverse scored items and factors for each of the independent scales. There are two other scales I'll discuss, the LSSS and the LCAS. Now these use slightly different scoring systems uh, and I'll let you know how to use them when we get to them. After I introduce the five scales, I'll also go through a step-by-step -step, uh, instruction guide on how you can access these and register for a free license to use them uh, in your patients or for your own uh, dogs. So we'll start with PANAS, which is the positive and negative acti activation scale for dogs. Uh, this was developed for the assessment of core affect predisposition in the dog. And uh, it gives us information about positive activation, which is positive affect and emotionality and the mediation of behavioral approach. Uh, or uh, if we think of it from a PANC set point of view, uh, this relates to the seeking system. We also get uh, information using the scale on negative activation, which is negative affect and emotionality. 
uh, which mediates behavioural inhibition and withdrawal and this uh, is related to the fear uh, system uh, and also it gives us information about anxiety. So uh, for the, the PANAS scale, it consists of 21 items. Uh, owners will complete this scale and when you score it, there are two main scores per dog. One is an overall questionnaire score for negative activation. Uh, negative activation items include uh, frequency of fearful and relaxed states, uh, items related to startle, uh, responses to changing environments, etc. We also have uh, an overall questionnaire score for positive activation and within positive activation we have three sub-factors which are named energy and interest, persistence and excitement. The next scale that's available is the DIAS scale, which is the Dog Impulsivity Assessment Scale. Impulsivity uh, is acting without thinking of consequences uh, and includes strong sudden urges to act. So generally a more impulsive individual lacks self-control and score more highly on this scale. It's important to remember that impulsivity is more of a personality trait. It does not necessarily relate to a specific underlying emotional system, but may impact on behaviours within a range of emotional systems. For the scale itself, there are 18 items and uh, there's one overall questionnaire score uh, per dog, then three sub-factors which are named behavioural regulation, aggression response to novelty and responsiveness. Finally, there's the canine frustration questionnaire. So this assesses frustration tendencies in the dog. So frustration arises when an individual is thwarted from obtaining something they are motivated to gain. And that might arise uh, with absent, reduced or delayed rewards, or when there are actual or potential barriers to autonomous control. And frustration is related to Pankcep's rage system. The scale itself consists of 21 items uh, and uh, one scored. There is one main score per dog, which is the overall questionnaire score, and then five sub-factors, which are called general frustration, barrier frustration and perseverance, unmet expectations, autonomous control, and frustration coping. So, We've just discussed the three temperament and personality scales. Now we're going to discuss two other scales, the first being the LSSS or the Lincoln Sound Sensitivity Scale. This was a scale uh, that was designed to assess noise fear in the dog and it is based on retrospective owner report. The scale itself consists of 17 signs plus an 18th option which is named other where owners can input a sign they observe their dog displaying during exposure to noises which might be absent from the list. Owners will score both intensity and frequency of each sign. So an example here is uh, running around. So the frequency score can be either a score of zero for never, one for rarely, two for frequently and three for every time. The owner can also select an intensity score where one is uh, the lowest intensity for running around, it is a small amount, an occasional burst of activity, through to five, which is an extensive amount or continuously running around. So for each of the signs in this scale, there'll be a frequency score of zero to three and an intensity score of one to five. When scoring this, uh, you multiply the intensity by the frequency score for each sign. So just say, for example, we had a dog who rarely runs around, it would have a frequency score of one. And just say when it did run around, the owner had put, there's a small amount of running, occasional burst of activity. We'd multiply at one by one to get a score of one. When each multiplication has been performed, uh, simply add up uh, the uh, the totals uh, to get a, a final score for the scale. And it's suggested that a score of greater than 30 uh, should prompt an owner to seek help. But obviously, as all dogs are individuals, if owners are concerned and there's a score less than 30, it's still worth this being investigated. The final scale we're going to briefly discuss is the LCAS, which is the Lincoln Canine Anxiety Scale. 
It's a validated, reliable tool used to evaluate a dog's anxiety in relation to individual specific triggers. It was actually developed from the Lincoln Sound Sensitivity Scale, but it can be used in triggers other than noise. And rather than looking retrospectively uh, over time at frequency and intensity of signs, owners can immediately record a, a, a simple severity of uh, score for each of the, of the 16 signs the scale comprises. In order to get a total score, you add up the severity scores for each sign. And this can be a useful way of obtaining baseline values. Say, for example, uh, a dog's reaction to a particular trigger at baseline. And if the owners then monitor and score using this scale uh, when the dog's exposed to the same trigger during or following treatment, it's a way of you being able to objectively monitor changes. It's important to note that in cases where a dog's displaying fear or anxiety to a range of different triggers, the scale can be repeated to give a separate score for each and should be, rather than the owner taking an average of how the dog reacts in a range of situations. This is to be used for a, a particular uh, situation that they have observed. So I've briefly gone through the five different scales that are available. Now I'm going to explain to you how you can access these scales uh, online. So uh, the University of Lincoln has a intellectual or intellectual property or IP store. Uh, you can access it at the website provided here. And when you click on this link, uh, this is the uh, home page that you're taken to. The first thing you need to do is to register an account. So to do so, you go to the top right hand of the page and you click on the register button and then you'll be asked to enter uh, your details, your name, uh, your email address and agreeing to terms of use of the website before clicking continue. Once you've completed this step, you'll be emailed an activation code. Uh, the activation code lasts for 24 hours, so it's important to retrieve that from e your email account and then either follow the link within the email account or copy and paste the activation code over into this line and press continue. The next step is to set a password and activate your new account, which can be done here. And when you press activate account, you'll have a green uh, green light appear that thanks you uh, for activating your account and you now have a registered account. Then all you have to do is to go back to the home page and sign in with your email and password you set up uh, in order to get into the tools. You'll know that your account's set up because your name will appear in the top right. This is an example from the account that I have set up. So next we're going to look at how to actually access the uh, assessment tools we've just discussed. So if you go to the, uh, the assessment tools uh, section, which is the central picture here of the human head with the cogs in the brain, and then you'll be taken to this page uh, and just simply click on online behavior calculators, which is a picture of the three dogs on the top left corner. On this page, you'll see that the five scales we've discussed are listed. Uh, so the LCAS, DIAS, PANAS, Sound Sensitivity Scale and Canine Frustration Scale. And there's a clickable link to take you to each one that you want. As an example, I'm going to run through how you can access the PANAS. So if you click on PANAS, uh, you will then uh, have a, an overview of what the PANAS is, how it can be used and how many items uh, and the, the scoring for each. In order to access the PANAS, you go to the top right hand corner of the screen and you press order now. That will add the PANAS to uh, your basket. Uh, and if you go into your basket, you'll know there's something in it with the little yellow uh, 
number one beside your basket and you can check out now in order to uh, go through the steps for registering for PANAS. The next steps are filling in uh, more details about yourself so your email address should automatically appear because you've already registered it, uh, contact phone number, organisation details uh, and you do have to enter billing address information uh, although it is a free licence uh, so it, it's just uh, for information on the website. Once you've entered this information you uh, go to save and continue which is the blue tab on the right. It's important that you review and agree to the terms and conditions of the free licence. Uh, this can be done on the next page. Uh, you can have a read at the, the terms and conditions and then click I understand if you are, accept those. Once you've gone through that process, you now have access to the PANAS. Uh, so uh, you can either access it in one of two ways. You can click on the link for the PANAS, which is visible uh, within the red writing here, which can be done directly from the IP store. Uh, or you can, uh, and that takes you to this link, dogscales.linkin.ac.uk, uh, specifically for PANAS. Now, when you click on the link, uh, this is an example of the page that you're taken to. It, it is a page where you start entering uh, details about your dog's behaviour. So the first part you have to enter is your dog's name, uh, your dog's breed, age, sex and neuter status. And after that page you then uh, will go through each of the 21 items comprising the PANAS uh, and you give your uh, Likert scale response for each. Once you've completed the PANAS, uh, the, the system will automatically calculate your results for the negative activation overall questionnaire score and the positive activation overall questionnaire score, as well as the three sub-factors I described earlier. There's a brief uh, summary of the, your dog's results in relation to the normal range, uh, which, uh, the, which are, are listed here, and there are further links uh, provided uh, particularly uh, linking uh, to a paper describing the link between uh, chronic pain and behaviour problems. So if you want you can take a screenshot of this page. If you have asked a client to complete the PANAS you can ask them to take a screenshot of the page but this is the, uh, the page they'll get which summarises the results. It means that you don't have to manually score uh, the PANAS results for each case. Another thing to note is that uh, with the PANAS uh, there is uh, additional forms that you can download. So aside from doing the online version of the scale, you can download a PDF version of the scale uh, and the calculation forms, as well as a scale interpretation document which explains a bit more about interpreting the results. So these can be downloaded uh, from your uh, IP store account. Uh, so if you have uh, a need to use the scales with a PDF and you're happy to manually score them, you can do so using uh, these documents. So it, it's important to note that uh, in order to, if you want, if you want to access all the scales, you have to repeat the registration process uh, for each scale that you require. Uh, you can't currently add more than one scale to the basket at a time. Uh, however, your registration details are remembered, so if you log in, uh, you don't have to re-enter those every time you wish to add a scale. You can access all the scales you have a license for by going to the My Orders section in the top right hand uh, of, the, of the page. If you click on My Orders, this is what you'll see. So in my account, I have all five scales uh, which I've registered for. And in order to access those again, I just simply go into the view detail uh, clickable blue link uh, at the right hand side of, of each row. So I hope what we've shown you is that there are a number of reliable and validated questionnaires and instruments available for clinical use. And you can access these at the University of Lincoln's IP store. Um, the, the address is here. 
And I hope you now feel that you can start to use these in your clinical practice. I say, we find them very useful and you may find that as you use them more, that you gain a deeper insight into all sorts of aspects of an animal's behaviour. We've discussed these instruments because these are ones for which we've um, undertaken extensive validation. But as I said at the beginning, validation is never complete. And we can use reliable instruments um, even if their validation is limited. Um, one thing to, to note though, if you're using these instruments in uh, another country, then we've got to be careful about assuming uh, validity. Uh, some of the questionnaires have been translated into other languages and you just have to check that uh, they are suitable. And some of the items might be culturally sensitive as well, so they may not be appropriate. So when you talk about animals trying to escape from the garden, well, that's because most um, British homes have fenced gardens. Uh, that may not be the case in uh, all countries. So you just have to be slightly more cautious and not just assume that it can be automatically translated. And there are procedures um, described for how you go through that validation process. And even if you're using, for example, uh, them in the English language, but in perhaps Australia or in the USA, you may need uh, to be just slightly more cautious initially while um, you use these instruments and see whether or not people understand that the language that is being used in them. But regardless of that, in our experience, you know, people do find these scales uh, helpful. Um, but remember, they're not there to just make the diagnosis and sub substitute for good clinical history. Good clinicians, it's all about being personalized the medicine. I hope you found this presentation useful and that you find that uh, using the instruments uh, helpful to you as well. Thank you very much.